I want to just uh, say how honored I am to be here um, and so grateful to the organizers for all the work they've, that, that they've done to bring us together. Hamid, you have inspired my entire scholarly career and, um, and I find that since yesterday, your life and your accomplishments just have torn down all my walls to life and love. And so I'm so grateful to have been here to witness that. Um, this is a formal paper about the ways that you have inspired my work. Composed in three versions and in two languages between 1935 and 1938, Walter Benjamin's artwork essay is frequently credited with the introduction of the concept of aura to our understanding of ritual art. What stands in contradistinction to this term in the second version of the essay, which is also where we find his most sustained discussion, is Benjamin's evocation of the portmanteau that combines the concept of tactility in modern art with the idea of tacticality in modern warfare in the ger German term taktisch. While Benjamin refers to film as a mode of technological reproduction associated with the non-oratic tactility of modern aesthetics, medium for him designates a force field in which the organization of sense perception takes place, articulated by both nature and history. The term medium grounds for Benjamin the interplay between the physiological human sensorium and the historical. This articulation of the alterability of sense perception and its historicity in Benjamin stems largely from his deep engagement with the work of the avant-garde who from the early years of the 20th century literalized the Greek notion of aesthesis by turning tactically to aesthetics for the retraining of our sensory capacities. We have come to think of the avant-garde in art historical terms, but in the context of early 20th century warfare, the avant-garde was known as the smaller vanguard of a military unit, which was tasked with the work of mapping out military tactics. These were tactics that were necessary for positioning the less flexible elements of the central military core against surprise attacks. The avant-garde accomplished this by pinpointing in the course of agile geographical reconnaissance missions the current position of the enemy troops. The central military troop would reorganize itself and in this way respond to the terrain tactically mapped up by the, by the small military vanguard. It's well established that a mapping and re regrouping of visual perception of this caliber occurred in the early post-revolutionary years in Iran within the historical context of Hollywood's imperial presence on screens everywhere. This reorganization recognized that the configuration of the global force field, or what Benjamin called medium, was governed by a nefarious form of imperialism that combined the fetishization of the body with the commercialization of the female form. The locus of this force field impacted the positioning of film technology, the physical body of the spectator subjects, and the nation itself in ways that the revolutionary leader Ayatollah Khomeini would claim weakened Iran in its war against foreign influence. The regulations around the close-up, the shot-reverse shot, the imposition of veiling, and the emergent government's enforcement of modesty laws on the film industry in turn tactic tactically reconfigured the medium in the Iranian context, and it was the work of Hamid Nafisi that underscored early on the consequences of this rearticulation in the economies of perception for the emergent state. Some of the most innovative responses to this reconfiguration of the sensorium and cinema occurred in the separation of the recorded voice on the soundtrack from the body, of, uh, from the body in the visual track. Focusing his analysis on Mohsen Mahmoudov's Gabbe and Arsham Bani Etemad's The May Lady, Farshid Kazemi, for example, recognizes the deployment of Michel Chion's uh, Akusmetre 
uh, wherein the, the male lover's body remains off screen in the film The May Lady and absent from the spectator's visual field, but ever present uh, through his acousmatic voice heard through the telephone, the answering machine, and the apartment intercom. The acousmatic voice, Kazemi points out, is a voice without a body. It circumvents the restrictions on staging bodies in intimate configurations. This disembodied voice haunts the entire landscape of post-revolutionary Iranian cinema like a, specter, like a spectral presence, he writes. Uh, in Abbas Kirostami's The Wind Will Carry Us, um, we can name one example where the akusmet appears powerfully in the long and oftentimes glitchy conversations Behzad has with a grave digger in the village of Siadare and with his own employer in Tehran who sent him on a mission to record the rituals surrounding the death of a hundred-year-old woman. Thirty years on, in the midst of the Iranian post-election crisis of 2009, a strange nostalgia returned the nation to a people's voice, to the voice of protests on the streets and squares of the Iranian revolution, and to a people's assent to raise the shattering cry of Allahu Akbar from rooftops and balconies of a city drenched in blood. Each night, a disembodied, electrifying voice staged a collective soundscape misty with smoke and soot. Born in solidarity and kinship, the revolutionary voice of the summer of 2009 was recorded on social media platforms, platforms such as YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, by an emergent figure we named the citizen journalist. This was an eyewitness and an activist who moved alongside protesting masses, reporting on a present toward which the attention of a watchful global collective had turned for the first time online. What this figure recognized in the lightweight technology of the mobile camera phone constituted an innovation. Flesh was digital and the device a sensorium. Each activist carried on his or her technologically connected body the eyes and ears of the world. Each activist on the ground operated as a tactical unit, an avant-garde of an enormous digital global movement gathered online in protest. The ever-elusive Twitter subscriber at Persian Kiwi was, would encourage everyone to record as much as possible, for as he wrote, these films were the eyes and ears of the world. A rooftop poet would turn to a platform that had almost exclusively been dedicated to sharing concert recordings, namely um, YouTube, and innovatively reimagined it as a phone alarm transmitting the electric voice of protesters to the ears of a sleeping god. That summer marked the first time in human history that the medium eliminated the barriers to collectivity by permitting a significant corpus of subscribers the ability to operate as producers of content and to, in this way, amplify the voices of their global peers. The new many-to-many -many networks removed the overhead cost of both gathering in large numbers and of transmission in two-way conversations. This felt like freedom. In 
information was simultaneously localized and globalized. The geolocation of risky content was diverted by similar means. Subscribers used beta versions of Google Translate to connect and to interpret foreign content. Together, they actively trended eyewitness reports by using a previously unfamiliar tool called the hashtag. These tactically effective strategies simultaneously strengthened the disruptive capacities while supporting the institutional institution building capacities of these emergent online platforms and furthered the reach of the local voice in the global arena. As Hamid Nafisi recalls, this was the moment for the efflorescence of a new little medium, the internet cinema, with its simple, ubiquitous equipment to replace the formerly powerful little medium of analog audio cassettes, which Ayatollah Khomeini had employed so effectively to energize the revolution. Muffled and out of focus, internet cinema's shaky rawness signaled subjectivity and hapticity. The, the subjectivity and hapticity of the innervated camera body and its proximity to events taking place on the ground. And for the tens of thousands of protesters online who by virtue of this framing of the images felt themselves implicated by the reception and redistribution of digital content, this experience of cinema suggested a brand new historical moment in the evolution of an economy of perception. Unlike traditional films, which are highly planned affairs, internet cinema never amounted to a single authoritative film, as Nafisi notes, but in the shuffle of its reception became something entirely individual, personal, immaterial, and imminent to the spectating subject. The sudden changes of scenes and focus which characterize these early instances of Nafisi's internet cinema constitute for Benny Mean, for Benny Mean's artwork essay, the cinematic experience par excellence. The changes of combat zones and front lines which once characterized the tactical maneuvers of a military vanguard reappear as internet cinema's defining tactile aesthetics making it the true training ground of an emergent global medium upon which, but also by means of which, our necessary perceptual regrouping must occur today. Sara. Sara. The last two film segments I've played are examples of the internet cinema of this era as it is incorporated through techniques of decoupage and montage into traditional film made in the aftermath of the post-election crisis. Incorporated according to avant-garde principles of objet trouvé, these clips provide a glimpse into the transformed human vices in which celluloid and digital technology, flesh and data mingle. The acousmatic practice of Iranian post-revolutionary post cinema, by which I mean the incorporation into the soundtrack of the disembodied voices from short video content posted online, point to a revolt that is taking place in the diegesis in the French independent film Red Rose. The presence of this disembodied voice in the soundtrack makes us feel as if the revolt is happening just outside of the apartment where the two lovers contend with the revolutionary present and the past. The raw materiality and tactility and the tactile sensory impact of these incorporated electric voices jolt us as spectators in the midst of a romance shot entirely inside a French apartment as if it were Tehran. The local has transversed um, its spatial configurations. The Iranian tactics reverberate globally in an attempt to regroup the senses. 
lightweight digital equipment made this transformation in the perceptual realm possible as, as if mm, as it was this, the first active use in the context of state repression in Iran that alerted the world to the prevalence um, of a newly purchased, I'm sorry, so lightweight digital equipment made this transformation in, in the perceptual realm possible. And it was this first active use in the context of state repression in Iran that alerted the world to the prevalence of a newly purchased deep packet inspection equipment by, gover by governments um, in Iran and elsewhere. This equipment gave state actors access to activist geolocations as well as other information previously considered private. This breach, which at the time was attributed to the joint Nokia Siemens networks, stands today um, as the largest barrier to autonomy, privacy, and security uh, in the face of state surveillance and uh, corporate tracking. What I want to highlight here is that the economic boycott of Nokia by Iranian protesters in that summer of 2009 was another instance of their vanguardist tactics in relation to the economies of, global, uh, of a global medium. It was an early tactical measure which was directly linked to the tacticality and sensorial closeness of lightweight digital devices as people attempted to reclaim um, their democratic rights and civil liberties in Iran. Though largely dismissed at the time, the Nokia boycott could have drawn the attention of a watchful global collective towards the huge collection of data used to advance machine learning in the years that followed right there in the electrifying rage of that moment's digital collectivity and expansive freedom lay the evolutionary beginnings of an algorithmic logic that would come to strangle the electric voice by bo bolstering online platforms for maximum capital gain. And so I want to close by contrasting the tactical operations of a revolutionary avant-garde in the summer of 2009 with an emergent form of media production and consumption that now defines the transformed world of social media, online streaming, cable, and much of network television. Characterized by binge watching, that is an accelerated form of acceptable, addiction-centered mode of delivery on the production side and on the promotion of a social autism that devalues collectivism and social relations uh, on the reception side. Seriality, unlike avant-gardist tacti tactility and montage, thrives on fragmentation and atomization, making it difficult to reconstruct any collective memory whatsoever constantly swiped, scrolled, and clicked to the next new thing, this morphine drip of personalized entertainment, entertaining content, as David Bro notes in his book, Birth of Binge, is patterned on capital's new model of perpetual productivity and the integration of work and leisure. In a world that is more and more unequal, a world needing reinforcement by, by new forms of militarization, the digital world has become capital's only hope and the beacon for its promise of abundance. Filtered by algorithms and baited by clicks, viewers here participate in producing an acceptable form of social disconnectedness while building um, the global structures on which binge, um, binge thrives. While the operation of individualized, algorithmically siphoned content is captivating and satisfying in the sense that you are fed exactly what the algorithm knows you will love, these siloed modes of reception and circulation are at present libidinally and aggressively tied to new and virtual expressions of the movement of capital and most importantly, to the devastating destruction of all collective structures that may stand in its, in its path. Referring to the rise of fascism and the emergence of a new economy of perception, namely the introduction of film sound in 1927, Benjamin made the following observation 
in the footnote of, an art, of his artwork essay. The same disorders which led in the world at large to an attempt to maintain existing property relations by brute force, by brute force, induced film capital under the threat of crisis to speed up the development of sound film. Its introduction brought temporary relief, not only because sound film attracted the masses back into the cinema, but also because it consolidated new capital from the electricity industry with that of film. The long patent war over the, writing, over the wiring of theaters for the voice took place effectively in the boardrooms of electrical giants represented by huge organizations not unlike our contemporary Meta or Facebook. Thus considered from the outside, Benjamin writes, sound film promoted national interests, but seen from the inside, it helped international, internationalize film production even more than before, bolstering the monopolies we know today as AT&T and General Electric. Thank you.